How's it going, everybody? <laughs> so, I got some exciting announcements today, and uh, I haven't preached in a little while, so I'm going to bring it in the announcements. So I'm going to say excited a lot, because there's a lot of exciting stuff. Starting with, this is the last time for a while I'll be able to say good evening, church, because next week, we're going back to 10 a.m., Church is on Sunday, not on Saturday, um, and here's the really cool thing. We're going to live stream it, um, and, and what I love about that is we can't meet everyone right now in the, in the church building, but we can all meet together at the same time um, and, and find unity in that way, so I love that. Um, there is a, if you go to the, um, to the website, brookviewchurch.com forward slash live, I think that's a forward slash, I don't know, go to the website and... Uh, it, it'll be really easy to see it. Um, we'll have a, a thing there to click on. And uh, I would re recommend trying to get into that a few minutes before the service starts just to get, um, get yourself comfortable. But uh, I'm really excited about that. Um, so the next thing that's really cool is we are going to do a, um, a prayer and fasting as a church um, starting uh, Monday, the, uh, the 24th to November 8th. And you might ask, why fast? Why pray and fast? Well, um, as Jason's been talking about in this series, uh, we need to find ways to be the community in this interesting COVID season. And I think one of the ways we can really do that is we can, we can all pray, and we can all fast together, and we can all come to God and, and ask him to move in this really interesting season that we're in. Um, there's a lot happening um, in our community, in our country. You know, the elections are right around the corner. I think it's a really cool time for us as a, as a community to, to, to come together and to pray and, and to fast and to, um, to do that together. So um, really love that. And again, another really cool thing is that all culminates on November 8th on Sunday. And instead of a, in lieu of a church service, what we're going to do is we're going to gather here on site and hold a prayer vigil. Um, and what I think is so cool about that is, again, we can't gather all of us in a whole service, but we can gather outside the church. Um, and it's going to be beautiful. We're going to have candles. We're going to socially distant um, throughout the whole campus here in the parking lot, on the sides. Um, and so because of that, we're asking that you guys park on the streets um, and leave the parking and it, just so we can distance ourselves as best as possible without the cars in the way. Um, but I, I'm just so excited for us to be able to come together in, in one uh, setting as the church and, again, to just pray in a time where we're just facing a lot of interesting stuff right now. Um, and that'll be, again, right after, you know, kind of the election stuff and just, I think, a cool time for us to pray. Um, and to lift up God and to, and to say, hey, we trust you moving forward and what you're doing, and, uh, and we're, we're, we're the church, and we're going to rally behind you. Um, and again, another really cool thing. <laughs> the following Sunday, um, so the, what is that, the 15th, we're going to do baptisms here in church. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Um, what's really cool is we fortified the stage over here. We're going to have a baptismal pool that we got, um, and so we could do baptisms here on site during the service, um, whereas before we had to go to, I think it was Silver Lake, um, and do that off site. So it's really cool. Um, if you're interested in, in being baptized, um, email us, reach out to us, let us know, um, because it'd be really cool just to see um, how many people we can get uh, making that decision and, and, and getting baptized. Um, so, guys, this, this, service, uh, this uh, series has been really amazing. Um, our life group, we are having such rich conversations talking about it um, and everything. And, and Jason, I just want to say thank you, man, for this, this series. This has been, I think, what we needed. Um, so I'm going to pray as he uh, makes his way up here. Um, Father, we thank you so much for, for what you're doing right now in, in our church. Um, we can't come together right now and, and, and just be together, but what we can do is we can unify um, in the ways that we can, um, through the Spirit, through um, just connection, Lord, whether it's online, whether it's in person, um, Lord, we just thank you for that. You move even when there's obstacles in the way, and we're seeing that time and time again, Lord, so would you, would you please speak through Jason today um, as he comes to encourage us and to, and to deliver your word, Lord, so we thank you so much for that. Amen. That was really well done, and he's had a lot going on today. I won't get into it. He's had a lot going on today. So um, you, that was excellent. You're almost as good looking as the other announcements person. <laughs> well, 
Well, you guys, um, Dave, can we get more lighting in the house? I can barely, I want to see people. Yeah, there we go. This is week three of the series that we've been in called Together Again. And um, for the last couple of weeks, we've been asking kind of a basic question. And it's how can we be the church right now with all that's going on right now in COVID? Because in many ways, when it comes to us being a family together, a lot of things have been on pause for a long time. But you guys, I think, I think we need each other. I think we really need each other. And so I don't know about you, but I am not okay saying, well, I guess we can just resume being a church family together someday when this is all over. Now, we're going to have to tweak things. We're going to have to get creative. We're going to have to take care to honor one another's comfort levels and some differences among us. We're going to have to be willing to operate in less than ideal circumstances again and again and again. But the call to love and support one another still stands for us. For the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at the early church. What what was it like to follow Jesus in that very first gathering of of Jesus followers together? And so I want want us to look again at what that community was like, because this is, I just think, breathtaking. Again, the, the context is that Jesus has just left. He's, he's just left, been gone a couple weeks, and Peter has just preached in Jerusalem. 3,000 people have decided to be baptized and to follow Jesus, and they have entered into this brand new community together, and they're trying to figure it out. And here is what that community was like. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves to these things. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I just think that this is a deeply inspiring description of what a church can be. And these people were captivated by the way of Jesus. And they devoted themselves to learning and living together in that way. They devoted themselves to experiencing his way together. Nobody was in this thing alone. And in that first community, they devoted themselves to many things. But look at the very first thing that we're told they made a huge priority. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they were desperate to learn to live in the way of Jesus. And they looked to those that had been with him to teach them. They wanted to know what Jesus said. They wanted to know what Jesus did. They wanted to know how they could begin living into it, and they were absolutely devoted to this. Okay, question. What are you devoted to these days? What are you devoted to these days? Like, what are you utterly devoted to? What are you, what are you willing to organize your life around? What are you willing to make sacrifices for? What do you spend your time dreaming about? I mean, think about your time. Think about your money. Think about the space in your brain. What are you truly devoted to these days? What is your life all about? What is it built upon? Well, for that first community, it was built on or devoted to many things, but the very first thing mentioned is the apostles' teaching. It was the community learning to live the way of Jesus together. And it's interesting to me that, you know, nobody knew what to call this new community. Now, these days, we call it Christianity. Okay, but they didn't. That term came much later. You know what they called themselves at the beginning? Anybody know what they called themselves? The way. They just called themselves the way. This was a brand new way of life. It was a brand new way to be human, and they were thrilled about it, and they were devoted to it. Now, in our day and age, 
There's no lack of things that we can be devoted to. I mean, the smorgasbord of options for us, even in COVID, really, is, is staggering. And there's no lack of voices telling us what we should be devoted to. Everybody has a way. Everybody has a way. A philosophy about human flourishing. There are, are so many voices telling us, right, all the time, the best way to live. In fact, these days, it feels like those voices are shouting at us. In this past season, many voices have become very, very loud. It feels like people are trying to kind of out-shout one another. But for followers of Jesus, there is really one single voice that matters most. And so this past spring and summer, we spent 15 weeks looking at Jesus' teaching. We spent over three months in, in uh, what the, the text that's called the sermon, the sermon on the Mount. And it is the most complete collection of Jesus' teachings on historical record. It is like Jesus' manifesto on a totally new way to be human. And as I studied his words again, and I've taught on that passage a couple of different times over the years, but as I studied his words again, you guys, as I came to understand what he was talking about in a deeper way, it took my breath away. Like, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the hurting. Don't, don't let anger and hate get a foothold in you. Love your enemies. Go the extra mile. Give the shirt off your back. Turn the other cheek. Why? Because you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are God's children, and so pray deeply and give generously and store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus is teaching us a radically different approach to human flourishing. And the more that I understand it, honestly, and I'm learning more all the time, the more captivated I am by it. And so I just want to say that as a community that follows Jesus, guys, learning his way has to be central to all that we are together. Community can't just be about us hanging out with one another. It can't just be about having friends. Those, that matters. That's a big deal. And that's an important part of what we do. But you guys, there is so much more. And today, I want us to think a little bit deeply about the more that Jesus has for us. So we're going to revisit Jesus' uh, closing from the Sermon on the Mount. And the setting is that after painting a picture of a radically different way to be human, Jesus brought that teaching to a close with these words. He said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Now, we just talked about this passage four months ago, but in light of us focusing on being back together again, I find this to be so, so relevant. And so I want us to revisit it a little bit today and work through it again a little bit today because I think this has so much to say to us and our world right now. So to begin, well, let's think about how much the world has actually changed from Jesus to us. And I want to start by giving you three ideas about our modern world. Three ideas from three key thinkers over the last few decades. Okay, and again, we talked about this just a few months ago, but I think this is, this is really good to get our minds around. First, we have Buckminster Fuller. You guys all know Buckminster Fuller? <laughs> he started as an architect, and he invented the geodesic dome, okay, like the one at Disney World. And then he went on to become a futurist and a systems theorist. And in his book, Critical Path, he came up with what he called the knowledge doubling curve. He estimated that from the year of Jesus' birth 
It took 1,500 years for the cumulative knowledge in all human civilization to double. But from there, it only took 250 years for it to double again. From there, it doubled every 100 years up to World War II, and after that, it doubled every 25 years until the 90s, where it doubled every 12 to 13 months. Okay, and now, by many estimates, depending on which strategist you read, it actually doubles every 12 to 13 hours. You guys think about how crazy fast that is. Like if you were born the same year as Jesus, it would take 1,500 years for everything there is to know to double. If you were born at six o'clock this morning, it would have doubled by the end of dinner. So thought number one, we have more information than ever before. For good reason, ours is called the information age. Okay, second idea, secondly, Thomas Friedman, a journalist for the New York Times, in his best-selling book, Thank You for Being Late, he writes about what he calls the age of acceleration. And this is a term for the modern world in which we live. The idea is that everything has sped up to this like breakneck speed, and that technology is increasing faster than the human capacity to adapt. As human beings, we simply cannot keep up with the pace of change. And this has created an age of anxiety where at least a low level of anxiety is the new normal. The idea is that many of us feel chronically behind the curve, we're running to play catch up, exhausted by all the change, and no matter how much we know or do, it's never enough. Does anybody here ever feel that kind of anxiety? I do. So Fuller recognized that we have more information than ever before. Friedman adds that number two, we feel overwhelmed by all the information. Okay, finally, idea number three. Neil Postman, a cultural commentator from NYU, wrote in a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And in it, he coined the phrase information to action ratio. So how much of the information that's coming at us do we actually act upon in some way? And he writes about our modern, he writes this about our modern age. He says, the tie between information and action has been severed. Information is now a commodity that can be bought and sold or used as a form of entertainment or worn like a garment to enhance one's status. It comes indiscriminately, directed at no one in particular, disconnected from usefulness. We are glutted with information, drowning in, in information, have no control over it, and don't know what to do with it. And it's fascinating, because he points to a particular invention as the start of all this. Now, we might envision that that invention would be the personal computer, or the internet, or Wi-Fi, or the smartphone, or social media, right? But he points to a much earlier invention. Does anybody remember from June what that invention is? The telegraph. Because with the telegraph, the invention of the telegraph, for the first time, information, and particularly news, could travel across the world at lightning speed. And so news, for the first time in human history, became disconnected from your time and place. Prior to that, pretty much the only news you heard about was local. It was from your town. And most people lived in rural areas, small towns. So if you heard bad news, it was usually by word of mouth. Something like, hey, Mike's barn is on fire. But in that day, if you heard something like that, what, what would you do? Well, you, you wouldn't go start a hashtag, right? Hashtag no more barn fires on our watch. Right? You wouldn't spread awareness about barn fires on social media. You wouldn't start a blog on barn fires or attend, attend a lecture series on it. What would you do? Yeah, you grab a bucket and, and you run to the house and you help put out the fire. The point is, you could do something about most of the news you heard. Today, we hear all kinds of news from all over the world and often we have zero ability to do anything about it. 
And so Postman says that what that creates in the human psyche is this. It is a new human state where we are used to hearing all kinds of information, could be news or self-help or psychology or whatever, science, but we hear information and we can even be moved by it, but then we do absolutely nothing about it. And that's normal. Postman says that we now have a dangerously low information to action ratio. So let me recap, three ideas. Number one, we have more information than ever before. Number two, we feel overwhelmed by all the information. And number three, we're used to hearing information and then doing absolutely nothing about it. Okay, back to Jesus. If you want to apprentice under Jesus, if you want to begin to experience life in what he called the kingdom of the heavens or the kingdom of God, the reality of what God is up to right now on earth, then you cannot have a low information to action ratio when it comes to the teachings of Jesus. Let's work our way through his words. He ends his sermon saying, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. So the goal is to put them into practice, to act on them, to live them, to build your life upon them. So do you see, like, if you and I want to apprentice under Jesus, if we're serious about beginning to live into his vision for human thriving, then we cannot treat his words the way that we do most of the other information in our culture. We cannot respond with a low information to action ratio. Now to drive this point home, he tells a parable about, about life in the kingdom on earth. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like, and here comes the parable, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So there is a contrast here between two kinds of people, two home builders. Now, we like to make this, we just naturally like to make this, we like to make everything in Scripture about a good person versus a bad person. Right? But the comparison actually is not good versus bad. It's, it's wise versus foolish. And there's a difference. It's wise versus foolish. Our home builder, one home builder is wise and the other is foolish. And just so we're clear, the word translated wise can also be translated smart or intelligent or thoughtful or enlightened and the word for foolish can also be translated stupid or unintelligent or not thoughtful or unenlightened. So Jesus contrasts two distinct home builders. And, and in this metaphor, what he wants us to understand is your house is your life. In, in Jesus' day, a home was, was even more important than in our day. For one thing, most homes were not like single family, right? They were multi-generational. And so a lot of people were counting on this, this place for life and community and support. But also, you ran your business out of your home. You know, whether it was farming or fishing or shepherding or whatever. So your house came to symbolize your life as a whole. And here, Jesus says, a wise person builds their life on the foundation of his words. In contrast, the foolish person, they may really like Jesus' words. But they walk away from them and never actually live them. And notice, Jesus doesn't say why. Maybe they're tired. Maybe they're really busy and distracted. Maybe they just prefer other teachings of other rabbis to the teachings of Rabbi Jesus. Jesus doesn't say. And I think that's brilliant because there are all kinds of reasons that people might hear his words and then walk away and not put them into practice. So he lets you and I find ourselves in the story. In this parable, we, we were intended to ask ourselves, which home builder am I? 
Am I the am I the wise one? Or am I the foolish one? And here's the disturbing thing about Jesus' story. In the short term, you can't tell the difference between the houses. Like from a distance, both houses look pretty much the same. They're decorated well and they look quite nice actually. And Jesus is making a critical point. In the short term, looking at two lives, they might actually look very similar. Two people might have the same job. They might work at Microsoft or Boeing, or they might be a teacher, or they work at Google, or they work at Starbucks, or whatever. They may work out at the same gym. They might even have a similar routine. They might like to eat at the same places, like the same foods, like the same drinks. They might both have a dog. They might both have a Labradoodle or a Golden Doodle or some sort of a doodle. (laughs) Apparently, blending everything with a doodle is the way to go these days. But from a distance, the two lives or houses, they look basically the same. You can hardly tell them apart until what? Until the flood comes. And Jesus is saying, in the short term, you can't tell tell them apart, but everything gets exposed when a flood comes. Everything gets exposed when we face a flood of hardship, a terrible and sudden diagnosis, a tragedy, the loss of a loved one, unemployment, the death of a dream, bad news, some kind of catastrophe. A flood comes and washes into our life. And notice, it's not if this flood comes, but when this flood comes. The flood will come. For some of you, it is flooding right now. But, for, but even if, if, if things are pretty good for you right now, um, I'm here just to uplift you and encourage you tonight. The flood is coming. <laughs> it's coming. We're all getting older. I, you know what, guys? I, this, I wasn't going to put this in there, but can I just say something? I am now in a season of my life where people like to say, hey, you look pretty good. And I'm like, thanks, man. They're like, you look pretty good. And then they tag on something. For a man, what? Your age. It's coming. It's coming for all of you. There is a flood that is coming. Our bodies are breaking down. But guys, you know, I love that Jesus is brutally honest about the human condition. And this is part of what makes Jesus' teaching ring so true to me. Because in this day of like self-help and the unhelpful pep talk, Jesus is brutally honest. He says, guys, life is hard. Whether you follow him or not, it's hard. So the wise person and the fool go through the same flood. Those that build their life on practicing the way of Jesus and those that do not build their life on practicing the way of Jesus, they they must both go through the flood. And this is what's so realistic and honest from Jesus and his teaching. Jesus does not lead you out of hardship. He leads you through hardship. There are a lot of really immature followers of Jesus and false false teachers that that really try to deny this and try to live as if this is not true. They believe that if somehow, if you live faithfully, that there is no hardship for you, that God will somehow spare you and protect you from all of that. There's a spiritual word for that. It's called baloney. (laughs) And here's the thing, you guys, that is a crisis of faith waiting to happen. Because a flood is coming. Whether you're faithful to Jesus or not, it's coming. Someday something will shake the house of your life to the core. And this is what Jesus wants us to understand. The flood will reveal what your life is actually built upon. And it will be either one of the best moments or worst moments of your life. So it's really, really important to consider the foundation of your life. If your life is built on greed or if it's built on materialism and acquiring stuff, if it's built on competition, getting ahead of some other someone or someone's, no matter the cost, if it's built around sex or youth or beauty, if it's built around your appearance or the way people perceive you, 
If it's built on popularity, how many people follow you? If it's built on hedonism, getting as much pleasure as possible and living the good life? If it's built on travel and eating at nice places, being able to go anywhere, do anything you want? If it's built on safety and predictability and creating a bubble around yourself so that nothing can hurt you? knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. If, guys, if it is built on any of that kind of stuff, the flood will come and it will wipe you out. Jesus is offering you and me a new way to be human. It's a way that actually can withstand the various floods of life that are bound to come. And Jesus says there are two builders one foolish, one wise. Because how we respond to him and his words and his invitation will make or break us one day. And so I just want to say, the invitation of Jesus, and there's a lot of confusion about this in certain parts of Christian culture, the invitation of Jesus is not to pray a prayer one day, to go to Christian camp and get saved by praying the right prayer, and then spend the rest of your life ignoring the teachings of Jesus. Just relying on the reality that you prayed a prayer once, so one day, now, you can go to heaven when you die. And the invitation isn't to go to church. And the invitation isn't to be a cultural Christian, using Christian terminology and Christian decorations in your house and do a few religious things along the way. There's a big difference between a cultural Christian and a person that's actually apprenticing under the way of Jesus. And you guys know this. We all know this because we've seen it. And when do we see it the most? We see it when somebody gets hit with a flood. For the apprentice of Jesus, the flood is still hard. But it doesn't bring the house of their life crashing to the ground. Why? Because Jesus and his way are a solid foundation. You can rest your feet there. And right now, some of you guys, you are desperate for that. Because the world feels like never-ending chaos right now. It feels utterly out of control. And again, we, we live in a day and age where we have more information than ever before, we feel overwhelmed by all the information, and we're used to hearing information and then doing nothing about it. Because you can't possibly respond to all of the teaching that's out there. You can't possibly please all of the shouting voices. You can't. Jesus is offering a really simple solution to all of us. And it's this. Just listen for one single voice. Build your life on a single way. Jesus and his way. That's the invitation. Does that sound crazy? It sounds crazy. I think it sounds crazy depending on who you think Jesus is. It depends on what kind of authority you think Jesus has. And that brings me back to the hillside that day. Look at how the crowds responded to his sermon. This is instructive, and it's also awesome. It says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So the rabbinic style of the day was to just quote another rabbi who had come before you. This is what everybody did. They went around quoting rabbis. In fact, this is still the rabbinic style today, for those of you that are familiar with Judaism. Your authority was vested in those that came before you, and so it would be like, well, so-and-so said, and then whatever it would be. But Rabbi Jesus, he never did that once. You never read Jesus saying, well, Rabbi so-and-so said. Like, Jesus would, would stand up, and he would say, He would say what? He would say, truly I tell you. And then boom, he would drop a truth bomb. (laughs) He would just stand up and he would name reality. He'd put language to the way life actually works. He'd paint a picture with words of reality and it would ring true for people. Now the word or label for that kind of resonance with reality is authority. 
And in our culture, we are averse to authority, especially right now. But for Jesus, his authority, it wasn't rooted in a title or some sort of org chart. It wasn't rooted in his gender or some oppressive system. Jesus was a nobody from nowhere. He was a carpenter's son from Nazareth. His authority was rooted in the truth of his words. And it was rooted in his life example. Like, I love Eugene Peterson's, like, paraphrase of these last two verses. I love this. It says, when Jesus concluded his address, the crowd burst into applause. They had never heard teaching like this. It was apparent that he was living everything he was saying, quite a contrast to their religion teachers. This was the best teaching they had ever heard. The most potent kind of spiritual authority has nothing to do with a a degree. It has nothing to do with your title or where you studied. The most potent kind of authority is when you speak truth and people hear it and it corresponds with reality and it corresponds with how you live your life. Jesus of Nazareth had that kind of authority. And Jesus didn't beat around the bush about his unique authority. He wasn't like, well, you guys are pumping me up. I'm, you know, I'm just humble. And Again and again and again, Jesus actually made staggering claims. And until you see this statement as these two builders, as that claim, you don't really understand what Jesus is saying. I mean, you guys, you think about it. Jesus has the audacity to claim that his teaching is the foundation that you should construct your entire life upon. Are you serious, Jesus? Yes, I am. Guys, no rabbi would ever say that. Never. Never. It was common to say that the scriptures were the foundation or the Torah was the foundation to build your life upon. But no rabbi would have the audacity to come along and say, actually, my teaching is even more important than the Torah. Actually, my interpretation of the Torah is more important than the Torah itself. My teaching and my life and my way is the foundation to construct your entire life upon. That's the claim. The question is, what will you and I do with it? As a church community, what will we do with it? Do we, do we like really believe this? Is this what we're about? So to end, your house is your life. Everybody builds a life. You can't not. You have to build a life. You are building a life. The question is not, are you building a house or a life? The question is, what are you building your house or your life upon? What are you building your house upon? Like underneath the day-to-day activity, what is the bedrock of your life built upon? Is it Jesus and practicing his way to be human, or is it being built on something else? And if it's something else, what is it? Where is it coming from? Who is teaching you this way? Do you really trust their authority? Like, is it, is it the culture? Just our culture? Is it your inner voice? Is it a friend? Is it your mom or your dad or a group of friends? And do you really trust their authority to show you the way? I want to invite the worship team to come up. But as they do, um, I want to invite the rest of you to just close your eyes and do some reflection. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about who you are listening to these days. First question is this, what voices do you need to turn down, like the volume? In your life right now, which voices need the volume to go down? Maybe there's a voice telling you lies about the world. It just doesn't correspond to reality, but it's had your ear. Or maybe it's a voice telling you what matters most in this world, telling you what you need, what you have to have to be happy, and the voice is wrong, and it needs to be turned down. 
Maybe it's a voice telling you what matters about you or what you need to do or be to actually matter. It's a voice that causes insecurity or fear or jealousy. And that voice might be your mom or your dad or it might be cult our culture in general. It could be a friend, group of friends, a group of coworkers. It might be a sibling or a neighbor or a roommate. It, it might also be an inner voice that just speaks to you often. You don't know where it comes from, but you know you need to turn down the volume. So what voices do you need to turn down? Second question, what voices do you need to turn up? Who in your life is speaking truth and life to you these days? And how can you turn that voice up? Well, Jesus does speak to us through scripture. Jesus also speaks to us through people and through community. So what person or community in your world needs a bigger voice? How can you move toward that person or those people? Who is it that's speaking truth and life to you these days? And how can you give that voice more volume in your life? And then last question. How can you learn to live the Jesus way in community? How can you take a step toward a community of Jesus followers? How can you find a place where you are not all alone in this? Where you can move closer to Christ-centered community? And I want to invite you to break it down to a simple step that you could take this week. What is a simple step that you could take this week to move toward that? Maybe you, you reach out to someone, set up some kind of a get-together with somebody. Maybe you talk on the phone with someone who needs a bigger voice in your life. Maybe you organize something to facilitate community for a group of people. Maybe you gather in, a, in, in, in maybe you gather people in some way. Maybe you go into a place where people already gather, and what you do is you help the people there focus on Jesus more. So what voice or voices do you need to turn down? What voice or voices do you need to turn up? And how can you learn to live the Jesus way in community more? All right, you guys, you guys can open your eyes. And I just want to say that if you have a strong sense that Jesus is speaking to you about one or even all of those things, then I would encourage you to write that down on your index card. Don't, do not have a low information to action ratio. Write this down. And then after you write it down, I want you to write down, who are you going to tell about it? Who are you going to talk to about this? Who will, who will come into this with you, enter into it with you and support you and be with you in this? And then just one final thing. I just want to reiterate what what Casey said, we, we are going to come together as a community to pray and fast for 14 days. And we've got 14 days of prayer and, and fasting. And you guys, that is an amazing thing to be able to do together. To say we care about the way of Jesus. We care about what's going on in our world. We care about one another. We're gonna pray for one another. We're gonna pray for our church to be the best version of what our church can be. We're gonna pray for our community and we're gonna pray for our nation. Why? Because we wanna see God move. And we're gonna come together and cry out to him together to do that. And that's gonna culminate in a prayer vigil on November 8th out in the parking lot where you guys, if people are driving by, they're gonna see the people of Jesus asking Jesus to move in and through us. It's going to be beautiful. And I love what Casey said. Right now, we haven't been able to gather as a whole church for anything. We can gather for a whole church for that, as a whole church for that, because it's outdoor, it's socially distant. The vast majority of us are, are moving around enough in the world that that isn't going to be any more risk than what we're already doing. And if that's you, be there for that and pour your heart out. We're, we're canceling church in the morning so that you have no excuses. <laughs> and I think it's going to be beautiful, and I think God is going to move. And I think being in community with other people, learning the way of Jesus together, can be and should be breathtaking.